Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Close Oppenheimer, president of the Salisbury Forum. And on behalf of the board, we want to welcome you here tonight. We're just delighted that you're all here. Um, we've lined up an exciting fall schedule, including a White House correspondent, a political polling expert, and a Pulitzer Prize winning author. So, you know, we hope that you will join us for those in the fall. Uh, if you want to get emails for our events and be notified of them, please, if you haven't already done so, please sign up for our email list. And uh, there's some people in the back who will be able to add you to the list or just go online to sign up. We now have a Facebook page, so please like us and tell your friends. We'll be posting our own news and occasional announcements of interesting programs from some other nonprofit organizations in the area. And I want to just... Um, make a tribute, a, little, a very brief tribute to uh, Robert Sadlon, who passed away a few days ago. And he was um, instrumental, along with his wife, of running the Millerton Movie House. They were great supporters of ours. We've often shown documentary films at the movie house, and uh, we will all miss him terribly. So I just uh, want to pay my respects to that. Um, Tonight, we're delighted to host Ben Brantley. He's been the New York Times chief theater critic for 20, since 1996. Uh, during his decades as a critic, he's seen thousands of plays. And more often, in, oh, I'm sorry, and um, he often saves us from wasting our time and money um, seeing poor productions, and more often entices us to see worthy productions. In addition, in addition to his prodigious knowledge of the theater, he, his writing talent shines through in every review. Here are a few excerpts from recent reviews to give you an idea of what I mean. This shotgun wedding of song and script promised to be a piquant novelty among jukebox musicals, a form that has been multiplying and dividing like amoebas since the Abba stroked Mamma Mia conquered the world. This careful recipe for disaster winds up feeling as overcooked as the roast that's drying up in the oven throughout the show. <laughs> Words appear to be carved with scraping noises into the walls where they multiply, divide, and fall in random hailstorms of letters. I just love his use of words and the way he writes. So even if you don't see the shows, his reviews are a pleasure to read. For those of you who know Dan Dwyer, you know he is knowledgeable, passionate, and opinionated about everything that interests him, from politics to rare and collectible books to the theater, especially the theater. As a talented interviewer, he is the perfect person to engage in a conversation with Ben about a topic they both love. So please join me in giving them a warm welcome. To Salisbury. Thank you very much. I might, um, right? Uh, yeah. Um, as some of you may or may not know, as a matter of course, the Salisbury Forum, uh, because uh, they have these uh, wonderful events uh, through the auspices of Salisbury School and Hotchkiss School, invite uh, the principal to have um, a dinner before the event with, uh, with students. And so we just came from the Woodlands where we had a very very vital, congenial, and exciting conversations with four lovely young people. Yeah, should they have been drinking? The <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I thought we weren't going to talk about oh, that. I wasn't <laughs> asking. Anyway, um, did the conversation bring you back to when you were, you grew up in uh, Durham, North Carolina? No, no, I was born in Durham, but I grew up in Winston-Salem. Okay, Winston-Salem. Um, high school days in Winston-Salem, anything like the high school experiences that the, that the students were talking about? Yeah, the I mean, I'm always very pleased when anyone, especially a young person, is, is passionate about theater uh, because it was really the first thing I fell in love with. I mean, other than Bengal, my first dog. It was um, from the very first. Well, we had a, where I grew up uh, on the periphery of what was then Wake Forest College had a wonderful student theater program. And so I would see student productions, which to me, of course, seemed like 
incredibly sophisticated grown-up productions of shows like My Fair Lady, uh, Bye Bye Birdie. Um, they all seemed incredibly romantic to me, and I was able to participate in that too. And just the smell of the theater is still kind of a, a sacred smell in my nostrils. It's so, a, so what was your favorite role? Oh, my favorite role school. that I played? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the only one in which I was probably well cast was Richard in Awe Wilderness. Yeah. Um, I mean, that came very naturally to an 18-year-old boy in, in love with books. So Winston-Salem, you've got some high school experience, like many kids, uh, doing plays. Um, and you look forward to growing up Indian lawyer or Indi you know, Indian lawyer doctor or Indian chief. Right. Did you ever dream about being the New York Times drama critic? Oh, yes. You did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, reminded recently that I'd, uh, someone I hadn't seen since we were both virtually children said, you know, you did exactly what you were going to say, you say uh, exactly what you said you were going to do. And apparently, at the age of 11 or 12, I said this would be what I would do with my life. <laughs> I repeated this in my first big job, job interview out of college, uh, which was with John Fairchild, then the publisher of Women's Wear Daily. And he said, if you could do anything in the, in, if you could have any job in New York, what would it be? And I said, uh, theater critic of the New York Times. Um, and then there was this incredible long sort of you know, detour. Um, I didn't think about it. I mean, it never really seemed to me uh, a possibility. It was sort of what you said whimsically. Uh, so uh, I, it was a long and winding road before I got there after my illustrious tenure at Women's Wear Daily. So did you also have, a, like many people here, just want to come to New York because that's the only place where you could become uh, the New York Times drama critic? or it was. Oh, no, no. I was, I was so infatuated with the idea of New York long before I ever came here. I had a poster of the skyline on my wall from the time I was like eight. Uh, it, was, it was Oz. It was Mecca. And um, it's the only thing that I became obsessed with from a distance that when I got to it, didn't disappoint. Yeah. As Mary made plain, um, and as we've all read, um, you write real good. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so at what point did you know that you were a really good writer and writing was something you were meant to do? Um, it's, it's an art, artisan's trade, really, in my family. Both my parents were writers and journalists, as were my brother and sister. Uh, it was a very word-conscious family. Uh, if you misused a word at the dinner table, you brought the dictionary to the, t to the table, that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, and my parents were omnivorous readers, so they were always books. Mm. Um, and I do think the best way to, come, to become a writer is, is to read, because that's where you develop your, your ear for writing, I think. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's like learning music. I mean, some people don't have that ear, but if you do, if you read, I, uh, I, there was a critic, Dave Hickey, who writes about art, who, uh, decided he was going to type the entirety of The Great Gatsby, uh, because then the music of, of, and rhythms of Fitzgerald's prose would be in his head. So um, uh, that was a long answer. But yes, uh, I, <laughs> I, um, writing always came more easily to me than anything else. This is a corny question. I always ask it of everyone who's involved in the theater. Mm -hmm. What was the first theater you remember going to and there's an attendant question, what was the first Broadway right. play well, you um, remember going to? You know, oddly enough, I mean, because it should be like, you know, virginity lost moment, but <laughs> I, the only, I can't really think of the, what the first play I saw was in, in Winston-Salem. It was probably a children's theater thing, mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, it may have been My Fair Lady. No, it may have been Bye Bye Birdie at, at Wake Forest, the first proper, mm -hmm. you know, show with intermission and all that. Uh, the first show I ever saw in New York, uh, I was 16 years old, and it was the perfect gateway. It was uh, the original production of Stephen Sondheim's Follies. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I was, I was spoiled. I started spoiled at the top. Indeed. Yeah. 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 So you come to, you're at Swarthmore. Mm -hmm. What's your first job in New York? Uh, well, I took a semester off uh, and worked for the Village Voice as an intern. No, I was paid. I, I was the assistant to uh, a political columnist named Mary Perot Nichols, who was um, 
kind of fabulous, a great uh, old village, lefty type, uh, just boiling with conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, and then I went back. Uh, I wanted to stay on, but my parents said, no, no, you go back, you finish college. Uh, and um, my first job outside, uh, right outside of Swarthmore was with Women's Wear Daily, uh, first in New York and then in Paris. I heard you talking with the young students over dinner about it, and you sort of conveyed that um, you know, love of the first job kind of memory about it. Oh, I had a great time at Women's Wear Daily. What was so special about it, besides it being your first oh, job? Oh, you went to Studio 54 every night. Mm. It's, <laughs> but also, you were exposed to so much so early. There was, looking back on it, an incredible arrogance that John Fairchild had about the society and the celebrities he covered, and he imparted that to his staff. So, you know, at 22, I'd be interviewing, you know, Betty Davis or, or Sophia Loren or um, going to, you know, these incredibly um, self-consciously grand parties um, so you learn not to be intimidated pretty early mm -hmm. on. Uh, you got to write about everything. You got to travel all over the place. And I became uh, incredibly the chief fashion critic. I had no background in fashion. <laughs> uh, but it was wonderful. It, women's Wear was a great graduate school. It was wonderful training. You wrote a lot. You wrote very fast. And you know, and watching those dresses come down the runway was actually in, very, in, in a sense very good training for this job because you had to register visually and remember. How did this job come about? Because oh, you were at job, Women's Wear Daily and then you took a, a couple of years off in freelancing, I think? No, or, I was no? actually under contract to, uh, to Tina Brown, mm -hmm. uh, first at Vanity Fair, and then when she went to The New Yorker, she took some of us with her. And it was from The New Yorker I went to The Times, and. That was because I had been doing movie reviews on the side for Elle magazine. My first editor there was a woman named Alex Witchell, who went on to marry Frank Rich. Ah. And she remembered working with me. And when they were looking for a new second string critic, Frank called and said, do you mind if we throw your name into the hat? And I went, yeah, sure. And, um, and then it happened very quickly. Had you done theater reviews or theater criticism before? Um, well, I had when I was an intern at the Winston-Salem Sentinel and mm -hmm. um, also at Swarthmore, but no, it had been film, film reviews. I mean, I think I have a, a naturally critical cast of mind. That's uh, another legacy of the family I grew up in. Uh, but I did love theater. I mean, I was passionate about it. When I was living in Paris, I would get to London as often as possible to, to see the theater there. Um, you know, I queued up for returns when I was a, a young man in New York to to see shows, and it, it still inspires that kind of gut yeah. clutching excitement yeah. in me. But you never formally written a professional theater review No, and before. in fact, I had to audition for the job. They asked me to see, I think, four shows and then write reviews. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, I think so. Let's see. Uh, one was a John Robin Bates play, uh, Three Motels. Uh, there was... Uh, oh, gosh. Um, was it the Sisters Rosenzweig? No, that I did later. Um, no, I, I, you know, curiously, I can't remember now. I smoked a lot of cigarettes to write them, and then I quit <laughs> forever. <laughs> but So you're a quick study. You've observed and written professionally for Women's Wear Daily, but you're now writing for the New York Times. Uh, you, you must have taken some pause before you filed your copy and said, have I gotten everything right? No. No? No. Okay. No, I mean, it just seemed so improbable to begin with. Uh-huh. And, um, and they, they, you know, they gambled in hiring me. Uh, but uh, they had liked very much what I'd written, uh, not realizing, realizing my, my parents had written it for me. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and the Times, especially in those days, I mean, it still is, was it backed its, its, you felt very secure there. Mm -hmm. uh, you felt kind of insulated from and protected from the rest of the world. And uh, it was the way I had always talked. Uh, and suddenly I was being paid to do what I did anyway, which is ultimately what you aim for, I think. Right. What, when you started this job at the time, did you make a deliberate study to go back and to read the predecessors sure. that came sure. before you? Sure. Who was most influential? Walcott? Barnes? Uh, oh, God, no. Um, 
No, no, <laughs> not that they're not wonderful. No, actually, it was probably, I mean, it wasn't so much that I went back. I think I, I didn't go back and reread Times Critics so much, although I would later. Yeah. Basically, what I did was I read, you know, hallowed criticism from, you know, George Bernard Shaw, Kenneth Tynan. But the writer who had the most influence on me was someone I'd been reading since I was in elementary school, which was Pauline Kael, who was the film critic for The New Yorker, and did more to shape my view of criticism and uh, my sense of the excitement it could generate than any other writer. So what was there about Pauline Kael's writing that just entranced you from an intellectual point of view and obviously from an emotional point of yeah, view too? Yeah, I mean, it was so visceral and so cerebral at the same time, but she, more than any critic, I think ever in films, was experiential. She gave you the sense of what it was like to be at the movie, not as you would experience, and I learned that early on because I wouldn't necessarily agree with her, but as she saw it, and you understood why she was reacting the way, the way she was, and she had such a, a, a capacious frame of reference, uh, not only for much earlier movies, but for, for novels and classical music and, um, uh, and even, even contemporary music. Um, and um, she was the one who, she was certainly who I, I emulated. Um, she called me. Uh, when I'd been at the Times for mm. a year. And um, I picked up the phone and is, the voice said, is this Ben Brantley? And I said, yes. And she said, this is Paul and Kel. And I said, oh yes, yeah, sure lady. <laughs> 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 Thinking it was a friend playing the prank. But it was indeed Paul and Kel who was just calling to say she, she liked the way I wrote. She lived not too far from here. Yeah. Um, Did you ever meet her personally? I was invited, but I've learned it's really better not to meet your idols. Hmm. You just mentioned that you like reading Pauline Kael because as a reader, she communicated what you were to understand about her. Did I get that right? Well, no, I think she communicated. For, she, what she communicated, I mean, it's sort of an intransitive thing. You know, it's, she communicated her passion for what she was writing about. And you always have to realize with criticism as with any, you know, listening to a friend describe what book she read recently or whatever, there's always going to be the viewer, uh, the object viewed, and then what happens in between. And that varies from person to person. No one sees the same show. No one reads the same book, because we all bring such different points of view to but it. But getting back to the Paul and Kale model, yeah. is it your primary intent or purpose than to communicate your passion. Oh yes, I mean I do want to. I, that, I, that I definitely want to do is to, is to communicate enthusiasm for the theater, and why I think it's it's an art form like no other. But also, I'd like ideally for people to be, who have read me enough to be able to read me and see through the gauze or whatever you want to call it of my criticism to the thing itself. They may think, okay, I know this guy. I know why he would like this. I can imagine, I can see what he's responding to. Uh, I wouldn't like it, or vice versa. Mm. Before we get deeper into that kind of thinking about criticism, I'm curious about some of the mechanics of the times and mm -hmm. how you work. Mm -hmm. You see a play, what, two or three days before it opens? It nowadays. varies. I mean, there's sometimes I'll file the next morning. Um, in do the, you go uh, home and write right away, or do you let it ruminate no. overnight? No, I mean, I sort of let it marinate. Yeah, mm -hmm. I usually have my lead by the time I go to bed, in my head at least. In, in uh, the old days, uh, when like Brooks Atkinson was critic, uh, the reason critics' seats are on the aisle is because they had to run <laughs> back <laughs> and write that night, yeah. um, which is, does seem daunting. I did that at Women's Wear, I mean, especially when I was in Europe. but. Um, I think I'd, I'd be dead by now if that were the way, the way, the way it were set up. Uh, no, I see a couple of days in advance, often with critics' previews. Uh, sometimes, if I have the luxury of time, I'll do notes. I'll look back at what, what I took down. I'll transcribe them. I'll look at the script again. Uh, and sometimes I'll, have to, I'll just write in a rush, especially if I'm really, really excited. I can just sit down and go, whoosh, it's like turning on a tap. How, how extensively do you take notes? I do take notes. I yeah. can't read them. But, yeah, that's uh, the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about the act of actually writing something down as you observe it that kind of tattoos it mm -hmm. in, in, into yeah. your mind. Yeah. Um, they started giving us copies of scripts uh, within the past 20 years, probably. Yeah. And that makes a big difference. And sometimes I can see a vague correspondence between what I copied down and what's in the script. 
have you ever, um, before the play opened and you were working on deadline, had the occasion and the time to go back and see a play again before you write about it? Something that escaped oh, only, you? Only once recently. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's just not the way it's done at the times. Uh -huh. uh, and that was actually always Pauline Kael's uh, way, too. She uh, thought a critic should see a movie only once. Okay. And, and respond to that experience. But it's nothing so um, principled in my case. It's just the way it's done at the times. But recently, I saw um, uh, the inaugural production of The Shed um, in The Notorious. Yeah, mm -hmm. you've heard about it. And um, it was, but the, it was a, a rather esoteric production. It was uh, an Anne Carson poem that had been adapted to the stage. Um, and it was Ben Wishaw and Renee Fleming. Uh, some of it was sung. Uh, by um, a very uh, adventurous director I'd seen a lot of in London named Katie Mitchell. But in any case, the first night I went, uh, they were new. I mean, the, or the shed was literally just opening. They hadn't really gotten their press in order and so forth. So when I and a lot of other critics went, um, it, was, it wasn't a disaster. I mean, it was what it was. Uh, and I think I could have written a fair review after seeing it at that point. But things happened like the champagne bottle wouldn't open when it was supposed <laughs> to. Uh, the full sound effects weren't, weren't in that night. There were missed lighting cues. And Ben Wishaw took off his shirt at one point. He was supposed to have incredible scarring, uh, vestiges you thought of a war he'd fought in, and the scars came off. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in that case, the artistic director of the theater did call me. I mean, Norma, I just said, no, no, I don't do this. But he made a good case for it, and it was their first time. So I went back and saw it a second time. And in this case, because I generally don't read new plays before I see them, or even read too much about them. I want to go as you know, an average audience member with a certain frame of reference, who nonetheless is is going to be have it unfolded uh, in in real time before him. Uh, but in this case, it actually helped to have to have seen it uh, once and uh, to go back to the the Euripides play that kind of inspired it. Right. Press agents send around, besides the, you know, the images that your newspaper can use, also the full script of the play now. How oh, oftentimes yeah. do you go back and check a line of dialogue? Oh, or I, always, something? I always, you always do that. Do, yeah. yeah, great. No. Let's get back to the assignment of it. Your co-chief critic at the Times, how do either you and Jesse Green decide what, who covers what be, between yourselves, or is it something that's um, you know, prescribed by an editor? or do you sort of feel your way that you have no, a certain no, sensibility no, I, for certain plays and Jesse has a certain no, sensibility no, every, for the Every plays? month we just we sit down to lunch, or if uh, it's a, a crammed uh, month, uh, we'll do it by phone. But you know, it's basically like after you, my dear Alphonse. You know, you do this. Oh no, you should do this, and um, it's it's very amiable, um, and um, uh, it's been very relaxed Good. for the past year and a half. Good. 25 years almost at this. Uh, at 25 years. years at the times. Yeah, I started in 93. So it actually 26 altogether. 26. Yeah. Every review that's read that you write is unlike and as fresh as the one that we read last week. No. Sometimes. How do you keep it so fresh? I mean. Oh, I really it, like it. I mean, I, I do know how lucky I am. And. Um, the great thing, and I'm, I'm sure you find this too, is it's really good to be in a job where you have to pay attention, um, where you have to focus on what's in front of you and think while you're watching, now why am I responding this way? Mm -hmm. And so you've got all, you know, the whole machinery of your mind working at the same time. And I mean, the day you stop feeling that excitement and feeling that interest, the day you start falling asleep, you don't do it anymore. So do you think the critic's initial reaction to seeing something on the stage is a visceral, emotional one that then gets transacted I think intellectually into a written I, I think it's both. I mean, you've got two reactors operating, basically, when you see, experience any work of art. There's your mind, which can assess you know, according to, to what you know of the, the laws of theater and the rules and how the rules are broken and what's being said intellectually. But there's also your gut, and ultimately it's your gut that's, that's more important. I mean, I always know if I think a show is good because I feel it before I, I know it. And 
It'll be I'm smiling. I mean, it could be Oedipus Rex, but I'm smiling because some part of me is so pleased. I've seen this. It's going as well. As I was sitting uh, down, we didn't, uh, I hadn't introduced myself to you at that point, but I was sitting down the aisle from you at the band production of the Russian production of, uh, where the guy took a, a urination on stage with the beautiful Ark. Oh, oh Richard III. Yes. That was German, yeah. The, the German thing. Yeah, yeah. And I looked down the aisle, not at that particular scene, but I was, <laughs> I was watching you down the aisle, and you were beaming oh, yeah. with enthusiasm yeah. for, the, for what you were seeing. Yeah, all these and then the next day or the next day later, so good. I read the review, <laughs> and there was all the enthusiasm. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it is a visceral thing, I guess. And um, you don't disguise your reaction to, uh, no. to, to, to plays. No. Uh, my. Um, editor actually sat behind me at something the other night, and he, he sent me an email and saying, uh, did you like it? And I said, yeah, I loved it. And he said, uh, he said, I couldn't tell because I was sitting behind you, so I couldn't see your expression. <laughs> and I said, well, here's a hint. Don't tell anyone. If I, my hands are above uh, chest level when I applaud, that means I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's get into the grist of But I'll never do that again. Uh, let, <laughs> let's get into the grist of the criticism. Are you writing to inform? Are you writing to entertain? Oh, I think both, ideally. I mean, you know, people now more than ever expect to be entertained yeah. while they're being informed. Um, so, I mean, you have to make it fun. I mean, if you just start off by saying, uh, blah, blah opened last night, uh, the very weak new play by blah, blah opened last night. I mean, who's gonna read any further? Mm -hmm. um, you want to, even in this, time of synoptic criticism, you really do want, if possible, people to keep reading. You want to pull them in. And even if they aren't going to see the play or aren't even thinking about going to see the play, I mean, some people, like me, really enjoy reading criticism just as, as, as a form throughout the ages. Um, it's, but mainly, I think, your, your first responsibility after you're informed, and you, of course, you have to give context. I mean, if there's a production of Julius Caesar in which Caesar is portrayed as Donald Trump, I mean, you <laughs> sort of have to yeah. address the political implications of it. But, um, but beyond that, it really is, I want as much as possible to recreate the experience of watching the play, whether it excited me, thrilled me, bored me. I mean, I want to be able to convey that, and if it was boring, I at least want to be fun in explaining how boring it was. <clears throat> So that's, that's a responsibility that you have as a, as a journalist, let's say, okay? Mm -hmm. And the journalist uh, conveying to the public um, some assessment of this mm -hmm. particular production. Right. Do you feel a responsibility to the theater? Sure. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, what's my... the essential responsibility? To the public, to the theater, to the legacy oh, of no, the theater? Oh, no, it's both. I mean, ultimately, you're, I mean, it's, Ba I mean, you're, it's basically the public that's paying your check. Not, I mean, if, if, if the people in the theater are, then I'd be a lot richer than I am now. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's your first responsibility, but I think your responsibility to the theater is to pay attention, not to just shrug your shoulders. If you realize something's gonna, that you're going to pan something or think you might, make sure you know why you're doing it. Be able to justify it. I think you owe everyone that courtesy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the New York Times and its role in, in theater. You edited two books, wonderful anthologies, the New York Times book on Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, which is an anthology of all the uh, predecessors that came before you, mm -hmm. and another book called Broadway Musicals. Um, but but the, the question I have is, there are other fine reviewers and other fine daily newspapers and magazines in New York, but the New York Times is the go-to review, okay? Everybody around the water cooler wants to know, what do the Times say about it? Except there's not really a water cooler anymore. Well, yeah, <laughs> proverbially I mean, speaking. But I mean, even proverbially speaking, I think everything exists in the ether so much now. And I mean, there will be people always, I guess, I mean, the New York Times has that brand, and it has for many right. years. But also, if you follow someone who blogs or, or tweets uh, who's voice you like and opinion you respect. You can seek out someone whose viewpoint is as close to yours as possible. Right. Um, so, um, but honestly, from the very beginning, I just put blinders on. I never thought, I mean, this is New York Times. You know, it just, you can't. Um, and um, so I, Frank Rich always had the line, uh, critics don't close shows, producers close shows. 
Right. And um, I subscribe to that as well. <clears throat> but if I, so you totally reject the notion that the times can make or break a show? I think denial is an essential element of life. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Um, do you think the times can, if you go to see a show, let's say, though, in London, right? mm -hmm. and you give it a negative review, and it hasn't come to New York yet, mm -hmm. do you think a negative review from the New York Times, whether it's your review or Jesse group or, or anybody else's review from the Times, makes investors less inclined to invest in its transatlantic Yeah, process. I mean, from out of town, absolutely. Yeah. And the same yeah. thing for regional. If yes. uh, you, you went up to the Brookshires and gave something that might be Broadway Brown a negative review, do you think it makes it less likely that it would go to Broadway if it's Probably, given a negative I mean, review? And of course, you pull your punches a little yeah. bit in, when you're reviewing something that's not on Broadway. Right. And the one that surprised me, and it, was, it, was a, it didn't do well financially, but it was a wonderful production, was The, um, the Wonderful Town. Mm. Uh, was that Berkshire Theatre Festival? Yeah. 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 No, that no, was, that, uh, no, Berkshire Theatre Festival is in Stockbridge. Right. Barrington Stage. Barrington Stage, right. that's right. In uh, our town. Huh? Not our town. The um, Wonderful Town. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Sorry. New York, New York, you know. Yeah. Um, Anyway, that uh, it did translate quite nicely, I thought, and it was a very fresh take on um, on on a classic. But you know, I'd seen it on a stage smaller than this one, um, so it was. Um, I I was. I, you always feel a little apprehensive when you think of something like that. Fun home. I had the same feeling, and the current Oklahoma. I thought there's no way that's going to survive on Broadway, although it's doing very well. And here it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, Apropos of letting the chips fall where they may because you're writing it as cleanly and as purely and mm -hmm. as contextually as you can, um, still, still there's, let's talk about ethics. And what I learned is um, you used to be on the Pulitzer Committee. Yes. And the New York Times now has some strictures about mm -hmm. its critics um, being on committees that award the things they right. also happen to right. review. Um, so there's these institutional strictures uh, that exist at mm -hmm. the Times. And you've also written about um, how you personally um, really set up barriers to developing oh, yeah. relationships yeah. with people in the theater. So it's a two-pronged question. Mm -hmm. Can you detail as specifically as you can what the guidelines are to critics like you at the New York Times about how to conduct your business, your writing, and then also comment about your personal ethics. Well, they sort of intersect, I suppose. Uh, uh, I mean, the, I, I just realized early on that I would be very uncomfortable writing about people I knew. It's um, whether you, then you like them or you dislike them, and that shouldn't factor into it. And you also know um, Rosemary Harris, uh, lives most of the time in, in Winston-Salem. I met her for the first time when I went back a few years ago, though. Uh, and she'd always felt that, um, that critics and, and performers should, should, should exist in, in separate spheres. And she said, Kenneth Tynan, who was a great London critic of, of the time, um, she told me um, she knew him and his wife then, Elaine. And she was about to appear in the part that Marilyn Monroe would make famous in The Seven Year Itch. And she told him, I'm just not sure I, 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 I can do the girl. I mean, it's just not something that rests comfortably with me. And in the review, he wrote, Miss Harris seems to feel the part does not rest comfortably with her. Yeah. And she said, from that moment on, she said, I thought never again. Um, in England, it's a more easygoing relationship for some reason. I mean, people will trash someone in the morning's paper and have drinks with them that night and perhaps get a drink in their face as a consequence, but it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't last that long. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a, a great gatherer of people at, at dinner parties um, called me once after I'd reviewed Simon Russell Beale in something, a great English actor, something that was at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and she said, good, you loved him. Can't you come to dinner for him? And I thought, well, I mean, how much harm can that, can that do? So I arrived, and uh, there were the cocktails. It was a, a pretty large number of people. But at one point, someone saw that Simon Russ and B Russell Beale and I were fairly close in the, in the living room. And uh, someone said, Wait, hey, you guys aren't even supposed to be together, are you, in, in, any, in any case? And uh, someone else said, no, I think that's fine. Didn't he write he was the greatest classical actor of his generation? And Simon Russell Beale said, no. He said, perhaps the greatest <laughs> classical actor of his generation. 
Well, what are getting better? Well, what about the institutional strictures that the Times has in place now, so that people like you can't serve on the Pulitzer Committee? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes a certain amount of sense. Yeah, um, it's. Uh, I think the less horses you have in the race, the better. I mean, inevitably, there's going to be some kind of conflict if you're mm -hmm. involved in in the theater yourself. Although, I mean, going back to the you know 1920s. Uh, George S. Kaufman was the theater editor of the New York Times. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot. Walter Kerr wrote plays, and his wife did too. Right. So, um, so, and the current critic of New York Magazine, Sarah Holtron, is also a, a theater director. It's just not something. It, it's not that I live my life in compartments, but I, I do. Uh, but it's just I. I've become too personally invested in, in, in individuals, I think. Okay. Uh, Julie Harris, another Harris, was a, a friend of my parents, so I was never able to review her. Getting back to your personal ethos, though, you also mentioned the parents were journalists, so I would suspect that they had a set of guidelines and ethics oh, about yes. journalism, too. Yeah. So did you pick this, this, this really pretty noble and pretty disciplined sense of ethics from them. Yeah, no, it, de it, it, it definitely did. Um, Were they reporters? Uh, my dad was, uh, my mother and father uh, both graduated from Wake Forest when it was a college in the town of Wake Forest. Both became editors on the Durham and Raleigh newspapers, respectively. Um, and um, my father wrote uh, books, um, one novel published that was, um, a great local scandal, but it was. Um, but he he worked for most of his professional life by the time I was born at Wake Forest as the director of communications, and then the advisor to the president there. Uh, but uh, he dealt with reporters. He dealt with reporters very fairly, I think, after he he crossed onto the dark side, and um, <laughs> and yeah, no, we were very definitely aware of. You did. There was a journalist's honor for sure. Okay. Um, the democratization, a small mm -hmm. d, right. of opinion about the theater. Right. You got the Benometer. You've got uh, show um, the, the the rating system for like Rotten Tomatoes for Broadway. Right. Show score. Right. Um, and you've got people blogging all over the place so that you can get sometimes real armchair, sometimes amateur, sometimes pretty thoughtful reactions yeah, yeah. about plays weeks before they formally open. Yeah. So is. That's the only thing I don't like. Yeah, I like having the, all the voices out there, but I mean, there's a reason there's a preview period, yeah. and they do charge less for it. And I think to post too soon um, is, I mean, unless it's gossip, um, which is always postable. But, um, but no, I mean, to actually post a review of what shape a show is in. I, and also, I try to avoid uh, social media sites for that reason. Right. I don't want to have my... Um, my opinions preformed. Right. But with all of that stuff out there, and so you've basically got a social media or a digital word of mouth that's creeping everywhere. Right. Um, and then you've got a limited and a, dec and a decreasing number mm -hmm. of professional of right. criti critical outlets uh, because you know, the theater critics are being let go by newspapers all over the place. So if you've got increased democratization, small d over here, doesn't that argue for, let's say provocatively, more elitism from critics like you? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, somebody's I mean, got to say what's really good. In theory, and, and, I mean, I think and, people. And not good. I think people will always gravitate towards towards people they trust, and you may be able to find that, as you said, you know, and um, you know, uh, Jill blows blog. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are pe uh, those people, if they're that interesting and that good, they usually rematerialize in, in a more professional form. Um, but, um, oh, I think anything that generates interest in the theater is, is a force for good. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, and there seems to be a slight renaissance of, of, of interest among, among, among younger people now. So, um, I, I mean, I mean, honestly, between us, I hate the Tonys. I hate them so much. I find them so embarrassing to watch. But it generates interest. And so, you know, every year when Tonys come around, it's, oh, who's going to win? You know, who's going who's yeah. to do what on the red carpet? And if it makes people excited, if it gets people into theater houses, I'm yeah, all for it. For it. 
Speaking of the Tonys, um, a lot of people here probably read this week, you and Jesse did your will win, should win, and should, should have been nominated. And most of the people that you both list that should have been nominated are from off-Broadway yes. productions. Yeah. Now, it would be naive to think that the Needlelanders and the theater owners are ever gonna give up control of the Tonys, but do you think we, in an ideal world, we should have a Tony Award like an Olivier Award in, in yeah, London, yeah. where there's I mean, no distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because so much. I mean, there is. There's. I think partly uh, to, thanks to one producer. There's. There's been more experimental work on Broadway in recent years than I can remember ever, in in, in my career at least. Um, but still, the most provocative theater is usually going to originate off Broadway. The most original theater is usually going to start off Broadway. Um, and the idea that you have to be with, be a, a peer in a house that's got over 500 yeah. seats in a certain real estate uh, it's area. kind of arbitrary. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Um, Mary made allusion to it by reading that um, um, excerpt from one of your recent reviews. Um, and one of the things that, I, that most people, I think, find entertaining in the most positive way about your reviews is your really imaginative and creative use of vocabulary. Oh, thank you. And that you apply vocabulary and descriptions in a way that are unexpected. Um, so I went back and I read one of these Q&As that was in the New York Times um, a couple of years ago and you were discussing the phenomenon of wants, how you saw it, I mm -hmm. guess, off-Broadway and you thought it was okay, right. but then it came to Broadway and you thought it was fresh and alive mm -hmm. and you said particularly because it compares so favorably to all of the stuff that is uh, taxidermied right. on Broadway. And I'd right. never heard a play described as taxidermied before. So it's less true than it used to be, but there was a time when you, you know, had a choice of, of a Broadway musical or Madame Tussauds. I mean, yeah, there, that's right. There wasn't so, a whole lot so, so, what's the, so this is a slow pitch, but what's the stuffed animal on Broadway this season? Uh, oh, if I didn't review it, I'm not going to say. Uh, so okay. let me think. Um, I'm not sure that's been a problem okay. this year. I mean, sometimes you get these masterpiece theater revivals mm -hmm. that are just so stiff, you know, and um, uh, fake English accents um, that you, you kind of wince all the way through. I think there was a lot not to like on Broadway as well as a lot to love this season, but I'm not sure they were embalmed shows, that mm -hmm. that was the problem. So we're less taxidermied than we used to be. Isn't that a good sign? Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> I think Transfusion. so. Transfusion. Um, what do you do with um, personal criticism you get? Have you ever been verbally accosted publicly? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, on, you know, online, um, Alec Baldwin wrote a whole essay denouncing me for the HuffPo. Um, James Franco, when, although I didn't really pan him, but when he was in Mice and Men, I said it was too small a scale of performance, and he called me a little bitch on Instagram. Mm. Um, <laughs> My favorite transaction of this nature, though, was um, Josh Brolin um, I had reviewed years ago when he replaced Philip Seymour Hoffman in True West, and no one should have to follow Philip, Se no. Philip Seymour Hoffman. And um, anyway, it, I look back at it. It was a fairly gentle review, but I said he wasn't right for it. And uh, years later, he was accepting a, a Best Supporting Actor Award uh, from the New York Film Critics, and he drank <coughs> plentifully during uh, the meal before. And when he got up to, um, to accept his award, he said, I don't read you guys. He said, I don't think much about credits. He said, except for Ben Brantley, I hate that bleep. <laughs> and um, so someone from the New York Post got in touch with me the next day and asked how I thought of that. And I said, well, for what it's worth, uh, I really admired his work since in movies, uh, you know, playing the guy who assassinated Harvey Milk and the um, you know, the gunman and no kind of sort of, you know, increasingly deranged man with a gun and no country for old men. I said, I'm just so glad he's found something constructive to do with his anger. And <laughs> <laughs> that very, the day it ran the next day on page six the, uh, of the New York Post. And within hours, I had an email with Ben, love your comments in the post. No harm, no foul. XX. <laughs> Josh Brolin. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> um, you, you talked about Broadway maybe being less, less taxidermied now than it was seasons past. You've been at it now 26 years, we've, mm -hmm. we've figured out. Um, 
is the theater, what, what's better about the theater now? What's worse about the theater now? And I'm not talking just no, Broadway, know, but theater no, in general. No, I know. I think it's actually a really exciting time. Um, I think um, oh, when uh, Eva van Hove had two, mm. uh, an avant-garde director out of, out of Europe, had two uh, productions of Arthur Miller in the same season, one of you from the bridge and one of the crucible. That opened a door. Yeah. Uh, I think Rachel Chavkin's production of Natasha Pierre also opened a door. Yeah. I think for the first time in my time there, I mean, occasionally you'd have the quote, youth musical like Rent uh, or later Book of Mormon, but I think there's much more of a tolerance among both producers and theater goers for shows you, you just wouldn't expect to see on Broadway. I mean, the fact that this season you can have a radically rethought Oklahoma, which is really shocking. Yeah. I mean, you saw it at Bard too. When twice, I did, right? Yeah. Twice, yeah. Uh, we both like it, but a lot of people hate it. And um, that that just sp stripped it down, saw very dark currents in it. But for me, at least, it was all from within the musical. That was exciting. A show like What the Constitution Means to Me, mm -hmm. a dialogue with a, a historical document, basically a, a one-woman performance. Um, I mean, Titus Andron I mean, the Gary, a sequel yeah. to Titus Andronicus. I mean, it's this outrageous, obscene vaudeville that would never have been on Broadway um, um, in even 10 years ago. Um, and, and I even think the jukebox musicals have been better this year than, than, than usual. I like the uh, Temptations musical it's fabulous. a lot. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah. 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 Ain't too proud. And I went late to the Cher show. My, my colleague Jesse had reviewed that one. But... Um, I found myself seated amid shares, the real shares, backup dancers from Vegas. So I had a great time. <laughs> That's great. Um, in the book, uh, you've edited and written uh, the best text for uh, Broadway musicals. Uh, mm -hmm. For people who are not familiar with it, it's a beautifully, uh, not just a coffee table book, but it's a beautiful looking book. And you divide the last century of American musical theater into decades, about mm -hmm. eight or nine decades. And right. if you haven't read it, just reading um, the prefaces give some, a wonderful general oh, overview thanks. of American musical theater history. Uh, the term watershed is about as overused as the term right. iconic. Right. But what were the five, six, seven handful of musicals that really changed the game? Uh, Showboat, starting off with, um, <laughs> even though uh, Oklahoma is credited as being the first organic musical, Showboat is pretty much there. It may be a little closer to operetta than uh, the later Rodgers and Hammerstein would be. Oklahoma was the great game changer, though. I mean, up to that point, musicals had been closer to reviews. They might have plots, but they'd be silly plots. It'd be about, you know, which team is going to win the football game, or, you know, uh, uh, grand lady masquerading as a maid or something like that. Um, so that, and there, I mean, Oklahoma is an amazing musical. I mean, that's yeah. why I'm so keen on this this current production because I think it makes it accessible to audiences who or makes people rethink it. There is so there's so much, uh, so many layers of emotion and conflict uh, within each of those characters. Uh, and you think of how shocking the uh, the Dream Ballet by mm -hmm. Agnes DeMille about a, a very young, naive sexually confused woman uh, and having it enacted like that. You can see it on film, more or less, uh, what it was. Uh, so that, that clearly was a company. Uh, uh, Sondheim is responsible for so many. Company was, uh, and with Harold Prince, the director, uh, sort of created the, the idea of the concept musical. That, w that was when we started to get away uh, from the golden age, plot-driven. I mean, Guys and Dolls, I think, is, is a pinnacle. I'm not sure I'd, it, it changed the game in any way. Uh, Sondheim did. Follies was the first of the great pastiche musicals that used, um, sampled what you'd call now uh, uh, music from another time, and, but then also reinterpreted it through the years of someone hearing it, hearing it years later. Um, and um, Hamilton, mm. I mean, hair was, I think, a one-off. I mean, hair was like, oh, you know, naked hippies on stage on Broadway. Uh, it was a lot of fun. When you go back and look at it now uh, or listen to it, it's basically, it's vaudeville. I yeah. mean, it's, it's just, you know, with a, a different generation. It's, it's cute numbers and, and, and topical numbers and, um, and uh, people being silly and, 
angry and enjoying themselves. Um, Hamilton yeah. is amazing. I mean, it just is. It, for so long, I think there was always a, a huge gap between, for, for a while, there was a convergence. What you heard on the radio was what you also heard on Broadway. Uh, you know, Irving Berlin or Lerner and Lowe or Rodgers and Hammerstein, those songs would be performed by, by cabaret performers or by someone like Doris Day and they'd become, but they'd become great hits. Uh, and then there was a moment when what people were listening to on the radio, whether it was Motown or the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, had nothing to do with what you heard on Broadway, which was sort of going its own way. Hamilton sampled, itself sampled, um, what people were actually listening to now mm -hmm. uh, and using rap and using hip hop while still honoring, I think, uh, the particular uh, aesthetic of the Broadway musical because he's steeped in that as well. And um, the casting of it, I thought, was, was genius. I mean, um, saying that the white founding fathers of this country would have to be played by, uh, by people of color as a reminder that this country was indeed founded by immigrants. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, that moment where Lafayette and Alexander <laughs> Hamilton high five each other uh, over the, some battlefield and say immigrants, they get the job done, get, they get the job done. It brought down the house every yeah. night. <laughs> Would you put chorus line in the group? No. Hmm. Interesting, why not? <laughs> it's. I, I saw it when I was a kid. I actually stood out line at the, uh, on, online at the public theater to see it when it was in previews. I thought it was the most wonderful thing ever. I've seen it again since. It seems now, but it wasn't a template that was used again. Mm. Not really. I mean, that was a very specific undertaking. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the creator sitting down with people who had been in chorus lines, getting their stories and weaving it into a musical. I mean, I guess something like Working, which was from Stud Turkle's book, interviews with, with people about their jobs, was in some way analogous. But looking back, it seems to me the ultimate me decade musical, because it's so much about, oh, you know, my mom and dad didn't <laughs> like me, so I became a dancer. I mean, yeah. it's, <laughs> it seemed very fresh at the time. I can still sing every single number from it, and I won't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, I have a great fondness for it, but I think, it, I think it ages, and I don't think it really altered the nature of the musical. Okay. It, I don't think it changed the DNA the way these other shows yeah. have. You mentioned working, they're doing a production of the Brookshire Theatre. I know, I know. And, and Encores is doing one too. Yeah, great. Encores one more question from me, and then we're going to take questions yeah. from the audience. Okay, you took this job at the New York Times 26 years ago now. Uh, a lot of really influential luminous uh, critics came before you. Uh, and you have given them um, these following descriptions, which I want to read here because I want to make sure I, I get it right. You've described um, Alexander Walcott as scalpel-tongued, right? Clive Barnes as whimsical, Brooke Atkinson as gentlemanly, and Frank Rich as two-fisted. So using one adjective or a hyphenated adjectival Expression, how would you describe Ben Brantley? Um, enthusiastic. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Mary <laughs> and Bill. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just ask people to please stick with questions, no statements or commentary or anything like that. And um, do I see some? Next. I still remember a very interesting article that you wrote a few years ago in which you discussed a number of special productions uh, which you said the dramatic production and or the key actors in those productions changed your whole view of the play that they were doing. Yeah. And I hadn't seen all the plays that you wrote about in that article, but I had seen several of them, and they had affected me exactly the same way. Oh, I'm so glad. And I wondered what plays and productions since then might have changed your view of something in that same dramatic way. 
Let's see, I think one of those productions I wrote about was Kate Blanchett in uh, A Streetcar Named Ooh. Desire. Um, pretty much any time she does a classic, she makes me rethink it. I think she's such an adventurous actress. Um, she goes way out on a limb and sometimes she you know, falls, but um, I mean, the, the courage is incredible and, and the freshness of the perceptions. Uh, seeing Gillian Anderson do Blanche again in a very contemporary sort of low-key Gillian and Anderson performance made me rethink uh, its relevance about genders um, uh, when, when I saw that a couple of years ago. Um, every time I see uh, a Shakespeare play, uh, even if it's not beautifully acted, I think I learned something new. Um, Watching Glenda Jackson is Lear, um, although this is not the best production that's on Broadway right now, uh, but her in it. Um, I, saw, I saw someone who had grown up so insulated by power, who just didn't understand that he couldn't still possess it. And that was very, very interesting for me. How do you feel if you write a negative review, but the audience loves it and goes on to become a commercial success and vice versa? Oh, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I, th it's, it, I mean, going way back, I mean, to the 1920s, there was a play called uh, A.B.'s Irish Rose that no critic had any stomach for. I mean, every one of those reviews, when you go back and read them, they're basically written with the critic holding his, his or her nose. And um, it went on to be the longest running play up to that time. I mean, people, I mean, personally, I liked Mamma Mia, although I know people who think it's, you know, God's revenge on, you know, Broadway theater goers. Uh, <laughs> but I, I liked the way it opened on Broadway just after 9-11, and the, I liked the way people gravitated towards it as a source of comfort. Um, and, um, as I say, I didn't hate it, so I, I, so they were following my excellent advice, but but really it wouldn't have made any difference what I said in that case. I think sometimes there's just such a strong current between something happening on the stage that even if it doesn't get good reviews, people will will go see it, and obviously if it's got a certain star, it's not going to make any difference. Julia Roberts, whom I really admire as a screen actress, uh, came to Broadway in a Richard Greenberg play that had been done before off-Broadway with Patricia Clarkson called Three Days of Rain, and she was totally out of her element. Um, and it was said in pretty much every review, but people went to it. I mean, it amazes me that there's still this sense that if you can see someone you see on screen in the flesh, then it's just marvelous. I mean, it's sort of like in uh, the <laughs> book uh, that Dan mentioned of old times reviews, one of my favorite was of uh, Lily Langtree, who was most famous as the uh, mistress of the, the Princess of Wales, who apparently couldn't act all that well, but she wore clothes beautifully. And people would line up around the block to see her. You mentioned would people you know, go to see something just because a Hollywood star is on it. Mm -hmm. I've got to ask you, are you bothered when for example, a Glenda Jackson comes on stage in King's Zero and everybody applauds. Oh, I hate it. Yeah, I hate it's it really, applause. yeah. yeah. No it's very distracting. I don't think the actors like it either. I mean, I think there are a few. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, they, and actors have a lot of fun playing people like that, too. I gathered that there was a production here of Hay Fever recently, which is great on uh, the sort of emotional uh, hunger and narcissism of a certain kind of stage star. But no, I don't like entrance applause. And I don't like standing ovations. I yeah. think they should be rewarded selectively. I mean, if you stand up at every show, it's like sleeping with everyone you date. Yeah. You know, it's just <laughs> mm, good. Are there any trends you're seeing in theater, things we'll see in five years, good or bad? Yeah, I think, I think the most exciting thing that's happening right now is this sudden spate of African-American playwrights who are writing some of the most adventurous and, and provocative work uh, now. And I think, I think that's only going to get richer and deeper uh, with the success of these plays. The one that won the Pulitzer Prize this year, Fairview by Jackie Sibley's Drury, it's coming back to theater for a new audience. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a very disturbing, very original, uh, very exciting play. 
I mean, I think what's most exciting in this job is when you hear uh, a voice that you seems truly original. And I can say that's true of so many, well, Brandon Jacob Jenkins, the, who wrote A Nocturne, um, uh, O'Hara, um, um, Robert O'Hara? Robert O'Hara, exactly, Thank yeah. you, Jim. Uh, A Slave Play. Um, and Jeremy O'Hara, yes, is also, I mean, yeah. Uh, and uh, enduringly, Susan Laurie Parks, I think it's just such a, a, a rich, poetic, but very theatrical playwright. Um, so um, that's where a lot of the excitement is for me. But I think the musical is, is taking new forms. I saw a musical on Wednesday night by Dave Malloy, who I think is a really, really interesting composer. Uh, he did Natasha Pierre in The Great Comet of 1812, among other things. But this is about an internet addiction support group, and it's the chamber opera performed a cappella. Mm. And um, I mean, the review runs Monday, so I can't say tell you what I thought of it. That's good. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> it's. Um, and I'm not sure that constitutes a trend, but I think people, I think the boundaries, as in so much of, of, of culture now, are so much more porous. Um, and um, I mean, as far as like high concept Shakespeare goes, I mean, I've, I've had enough of it for a while, or I think I have, and then someone will come along with a really good idea. But the stuff that's affected me most of classics often in recent years, has been the most pared down, where there's not this auteur's interpretive gloss uh, layered on top. Um, and um, it's, I think also because of directors like Eva Van Hova, whether you like him or not, Sam Gold, or either of them, they're both rather controversial. Um, people, and Rachel Chavkin, I mean, these directors who take an entire, entirely new take on a classic uh, that makes you rethink it. I think there's more willingness to accept that. And um, it's, uh, and then you have the sequel kind of play, which I never thought I would like, but I thought A Doll's House Part Two was just wonderful. And that's an example of, of the present being in dialogue with the past. I think much of Taylor Mack's work is like that, the guy who wrote, uh, the person, sorry, who wrote Carrie. Um, and um, it's a very feckin' time for theater to my surprise, very adventurous time. I also think Donald Trump has probably been a great muse to a lot of playwrights. Yeah, sure. um, and uh, so you have more sort of, al not alarmist exactly, but politically engaged theater that we haven't seen in, in many years. Do you but tire of the um, m movies made into musicals? Yeah, yeah, kind of. But I mean, I have learned not to come with, with set expectations. I mean, in, in theory, I'd say, ugh, I mean, how unimaginative can you get? And then you see, although I don't love the entire production, but what Eva Van Hova did with the movie network is really interesting in terms of the use of cameras, and Brian Cranston gives one of the great all-time performances, but a lot of his performance is in reaction with the cameras that are used on stage, and then you see the image, image uh, blown up. So I... I try. I mean, jukebox musicals. I thought I hated unconditionally, but I really enjoyed "Ain't Too Proud" this mm -hmm. year and and the Cher show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I find that once you you know put things into categories, you're going to have to break your own rules. So I try not to. Um, Mr. Brantley, I was wondering if you recall. I, I don't know how many years ago it was, but um, the. Theater people in London challenged the critics to write plays. Yeah. Oh, to direct, I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, well, or I think it was, was both. It right on. Right yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. And the theater people came and reviewed them. Would, if we did that in New York, would you be up for it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I do what I do because I, it's what I can do. Uh, and um, I. It's, I mean, I, I think it could be a constructive exercise, a healthy exercise to cross that line, but it's a little dangerous, too. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to direct someone that I... Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it, it's a charming idea and I think a, a worthwhile idea, but uh, no, I've been asked to appear like in you know, the Shaw readings they do with, with all sorts of different kinds of theater people, but I'm also ultimately a very private person. Um, 
And um, I, I don't really like to put myself out there too much. Uh, so, Mr. Bradley, you, you discussed earlier um, how social media can play an effect in creating mm -hmm. some form of bias and how it has a rather infectious aura mm -hmm. with it. And I was, um, I was wondering if things get through the crack or, or you hear a few words about a certain production that you anticipate to view and also review, do you ever feel the need to take a moment before entering the theater to maybe prevent any preconceptions or, yeah. or ideas from yeah. entering the theater with you? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. I mean, my line is always that I think you have to go into the theater a virgin uh, waiting to be seduced and see how successful the seduction is. Yeah, I try, I mean, obviously you do hear the gossip. I mean, no matter how much you try to shut it out, no matter how much you try to avoid uh, certain chat rooms or whatever. But I think when you get there, you, you know, ideally you can't do it 100%, but you want to take a deep breath and become a blank slate. No, it's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. We're going to let Dan um, one more, ask the last question. One more question. Okay, at the beginning of the, uh, of the conversation, you talked about your first Broadway show being Folly. Right. Okay, if Ben Brantley were going out to a matinee or an evening performance and it happened to be the very last piece of theater you would ever see, oh. what would it be and perhaps who would be in it and what venue? Oh, it'd have to be every man, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd have to be like some, you know, major, uh, primal, you know, essential. Every man is, you know, the play that was done in, in cathedrals, uh, in cathedral towns, and I mean, from the Middle Ages on. Um, I mean, I'd like to, that would be the worthy choice. But if I were going to die the next day, yeah. Uh, the prisoner's last meal. It'd probably be folly. Yeah. Then. I knew you were gonna. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> ben Brantley, thank you very much thank for coming you. to Salford. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. That was fun.